I think I was supposed to have something here, but I don't have it. <laughs> I love to teach. I love to do it, love to watch it, love to talk about it. But I never thought I was all that good at it. And so I started studying good teachers. In fact, ah, here it comes. Thanks. In fact, I started studying great teachers. And being a director of a sport instruction research laboratory, that gave me a, a nice platform to begin doing that. And what I'd like to share with you this afternoon is some of the things that I have found in studying these great teachers. In golf, we've had the opportunity to study uh, America's top 100 golf instructors as selected by Golf Magazine. In fact, as Rick told you, I'm a consultant for Golf Magazine, and I help Lauren Anderson and some of the editors to select these people. And increasingly, it's been very difficult to do this. Right now, there is over 28,000 men and women who are PGA professionals. Think about that. You have to pick 100 of the best golf instructors in America. This last go-round, we had 600 nominations for 10 spots on that list. And I'll tell you, of those 600 people, there were some great teachers. As a profession, you have a lot to be proud of, because I know many of you, and I know there's great teachers that are growing this game of golf. We've also had the opportunity to study many of the PGA Teachers of the Year, in particular people like Dr. Jim Suddy, Laird Small, Charlie Sorrell. Um, I'm trying to think I'm blanking out on one more there that uh, has been really helpful to us. Uh, Hank Johnson, who uh, just recently got uh, nominated for that position. We've also had the opportunity to study the LPGA Teachers of the Year as well, and there's some very talented teachers in that pool as well. But we don't just study Oh, there we go. We don't just study golf instructors. We've had the opportunity to study coaches and teachers in other sports. In particular, we studied a five-time NCAA national champion gymnastics coach. We've studied major league baseball batting instructors. In the public school domain, we've studied physical education teachers of the year, national teachers of the year. We've studied an extraordinary expert dance instructor. We've had the opportunity to also study expert tennis instructors. In particular, in that pool, we did several studies. There was four Davis Cup captains. All right? And we most recently completed a study this summer with the all-time winningest Division I NCAA football coach. Many of you are familiar with the name Bobby Bowden. When Rick invited me to share some of the findings of our research uh, with you, I sat down and tried to figure out what might be most helpful to you. All right? and before I move to that, I'd like to thank Rick for the opportunity to speak with you today, but more importantly, the opportunity to be with you this weekend. I'd also like to thank Rick for the extraordinary effort he put forward in organizing this teaching summit. I think this is fantastic. So Rick, thank you for that. I'd also like to thank Chris Hunkler. Many of you know Chris. Chris has always opened the doors to this teaching summit to me, so I've been able to come to several of these and get to know the concerns that you people have. But more importantly, I'd like to thank the instructors who have given so generously of their time and allowed us to come study them, because what I'm going to tell you today is what they have told us. And rather than sharing with you our research methodologies and our statistical procedures and all that, what I'm going to do is highlight our findings by telling you some of the stories that we've encountered in these great people that we've studied. First, let's take a look at their experience. All right? There's two areas, extensive playing experience and extensive teaching experience. Most of us watched Stan Utley not too long ago give uh, some wonderful demonstrations up here. Stan gets a lot of credibility because of his playing experience. I'm sure most of you also get credibility because of your playing experience. Right? People look to you because you're expert performers in the game of golf, or pretty close to being an expert performer. Probably some of you hate going out with your members or your students because it means that your skills are now on stage, and you probably don't get as much time to practice or play as you once did. All right? Uh, more importantly than just credibility, the fact that you are a student of this game and you played gives you a student perspective. In other words, you understand what it is to struggle to master the skills that are required to play this complex game. 
And finally, your playing experience offers you an important source of knowledge. In particular, you learned much about the game, the skills that are required to play, the rules, the strategies, and the etiquette by actually playing the game of golf. There's no other way to acquire that knowledge that you have other than through playing experience. And finally, as players, you probably had coaches and teachers who taught you much about how to teach and coach. In fact, when we study these great teachers and these great coaches, one of the things that we find is when they were players, they learned a lot about teaching and coaching from the people that they had. Bill Strasbaugh is a name that comes to us all the time as being so influential to so many of you people. Some of you probably recognize Dr. Jim Suddy there. Uh, Jim was explaining to me that on very hot days, you can, if you are clever enough, you can use students to provide you with some shade. <laughs> no, just kidding about that, Jim. All right. Extensive teaching experience. You learn probably more about teaching by actually doing teaching than attending seminars, reading about it, and watching other teachers. It is a primary source of a teacher's knowledge. All right. What that does is, first of all, it allows you to anticipate problems. All right. Great teachers and great coaches can watch things develop in their lessons, in their practices, in their games. And they can anticipate when a student or when certain athletes are going to have difficulty. And because of that anticipation, they're able to circumvent that all right, and avoid problems long before it happens. Novices can't do that. All right. The other thing teaching experience will give you is a thing we call contingency planning. The best way to say that is if-then planning. In other words, you're teaching a student and you say to yourself, if they master this or if they understand that, then I'll do this. If they don't get it, then I'll do that. That's called contingency planning. That only comes when you're starting to develop serious skills as a teacher. The next time you're teaching, think about how you go about planning when you're going to make some decisions or change the course of action. This is how the great ones do it. In fact, Bobby Bowden spends most of his week preparing for a game, planning extensively. Then he tells us, as soon as the whistle blows and the ball goes in the air on the kickoff, all that planning goes out the window. We don't quite believe that. All right. But what he then does is watch the game, talks to his coaches, and then they start doing this. If they do this, then we'll do that. If they do this, then we're going to do that. It's if-then planning the whole way through. Great teachers do the same thing. Right. Extensive teaching experience also lets you know about students. Most of you here that have been teaching more than five or ten years probably know a great many different students. In other words, you know about their personalities, what motivates them, different kinds of learning strategies that they have, what's successful with certain students and not. And that only comes as a teacher in front of many students many days. You also develop creative ways of using equipment current equipment that you have versus other types of equipment. You just saw David Ledbetter show a variety of uh, toys that he's got. My friend Charlie Sorrell, if you go to his uh, facility at Golf Meadows, he has a huge closet. We call it his toy chest because he goes in there and, and he has just incredible things. In fact, Charlie tells me that he learns most of his training aids when he goes Christmas shopping for his grandkids. How many of you remember Star Wars a few years ago? I don't know if you remember those laser light things. They used to throw them out, and it just used to extend based on the centrifugal force. Well, Charlie bought one of those for his grandson one Christmas, and he was playing with it Christmas morning. He said, hey, this would make a great way to teach casting. So he'd give it to players, and he'd have them swing with it. And if it was fully extended here, obviously they were casting. He tried to get them so it would be fully extended at their toe. A toy that he was playing with Christmas morning. Experts do that. Another thing that experts do is they use commonplace equipment and they think of a variety of, of activities they can do with it. This study was done at the University of Texas. And they found that novices would look at a piece of equipment, let's say for example a golf club. And you say, okay, what can you use that with in a golf club and the, or in a golf lesson? And they'd laugh and they'd say, well, you put it in a student's hand and they swing it. Well, an expert looks at a golf club and okay, yeah, the student swings that, but you know, it can also be an alignment device. It can also be something you place in front of students and have them chip balls over. It can be a target. All right? It can be a way of touching students so they recognize certain key points in their swings. An expert can look at a piece of equipment and see many things. And again, that only comes with extensive teaching experience. The last thing I want to tell you about teaching experience is that what it allows you to do is teach 
uh, or experts can do this, can teach anyone, anytime, any place. How many of you participated yesterday in the, the 800 hotline tips? Yeah, I know many of you did. Great. There's a picture. Some of you recognize Carol Mann there. All right. Carol is giving a lesson. All right. Great teachers can teach anyone, anytime, any place. I think she's giving a lesson. I don't think she's developed a second career as a telemarketer. But what you've been able to do, how many of you have been on an airplane or in a supermarket and somebody walks up to you and wants a golf lesson? All right? Most of you are pretty guys who had a bargain shake in his head. It happens to Ed all the time. All right? But you can teach anyone, anytime, any place as an expert teacher. All right. Great teachers have knowledge in three distinct areas. The first is they have extensive knowledge of their players, of their students, if you will. They know learning strategies, motivations, and personality. They also have extensive knowledge of the sport, the game of golf. They know the rules. All right? They know golf course architecture. They know history. They know the etiquette. They know the skills. Okay? And finally, they have knowledge of teaching. They know how to teach this sport to these students. All right? And that's a separate type of knowledge all into itself. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about here today. Here's a little question for you. And we actually, conducted a, we actually conducted two studies where we did this. All right, let me, you put this into your head and give me an answer. Considering all there is to know to be a great teacher, how much do you think you already know? All right, think about that for a second. OK, we asked novice teachers, all right, people who had less than two years of teaching experience. You know what they told us? They knew about 75% of all there was to know. Yeah, most of you are laughing. All right. We put the same question to experts. You know what they told us? About 40%. These are experts. These are the people that are top of their field. All right. They still have about 60% more to learn in their opinion. We put the same question to Coach Bowden. We, okay, Coach Bowden, 72 years old, been coaching almost four decades. All right. How much do you think you still have to learn? He thought about it for a minute. He says, I may know about 60%. And they said, no, make that 50%. The all-time winningest football coach feels he knows about half of what there is to know to coach great. All right, here's another question for you. 28,000 men and women comprise the PGA of America. How many of the teaching professionals hold PhD degrees? 45. OK, does it take a PhD to teach golf? No. But what this tells you is the commitment that many of these great teachers make towards learning to teach better. I think if people like Dr. Jim Suddy, or Dr. T.J. Tomasi, Dr. Gary Wyron, would Gary still be a good teacher if he didn't have a PhD? No way, no. He probably would, yeah. Same with TJ and same with the gym and all the other who have uh, PhDs. But what it does tell you is that their thirst for learning has taken them to the highest levels possible. We have done research in multiple sports on where is the best source of knowledge for great teachers. And I've already told you the number one source, and that's teaching experience. They learn a great deal from their teaching experience. In fact, current studies that we're doing right now is trying to understand how these great teachers take that experience and extract so much information. We call it self-monitoring. Right? Uh, the results of that still aren't clear yet, so we're hopefully within the next month or two we'll have that figured out. Second, and this is critical, are other teachers. They learn by watching other teachers, talking with other teachers, right? networking with other teachers. I was pleased to hear Rick say this afternoon when he uh, encouraged you to get lunch, he says, come back here and network with other teachers. Take advantage of getting to know each other. No one else understands the problems that you face in your professional activities other than another teacher. So the more teachers you can get to know and the more you can go observe, the better off you're going to be. I'm telling you, this is how I learned as much as I have about teaching, and I still have a long way to go. Expert teachers and coaches also tell us they learn a great deal from their students, from their athletes. They do this by listening to them. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. Number four, and this is ranked ordered, our workshops and seminars. I'm not going to preach to the choir because it's a, a warm December afternoon, Friday in Florida, and you're sitting here listening to an egghead professor. 
right? Obviously, you see the value in workshops and seminars participating as a source of knowledge. This is Charlie Sorrell demonstrating for me one of his latest teaching techniques. That's a plumber's plunger on my head. For those of you that uh, are interested in this technique, I'm sure you could log on to Charlie's website, www.charliethinkshe'sfunny.com. But again, what I learned from other teachers comes from watching them and talking to them about the problems they encounter and how they solve those problems. So I encourage you to observe and talk with other teachers. Attend workshops and seminars. It's the best place to meet them. And then finally, email is a fantastic way of communicating with teachers. I can think of a dozen of you that are sitting here today that you and I have emailed in the last just two weeks. All right. Wonderful source of communication. All right. Let's take a look at the perspectives that these great teachers and coaches have. How do they view what it is they do? First and foremost, we realize that they teach people they don't teach golf. All right. The first time we heard that, we were kind of surprised by that. All right. Then it was explained to us. All right. You actually don't teach golf. You do teach people. Golf is what you teach them. I'll talk about that in just a minute. A watershed mark between a great teacher and a good teacher is how much responsibility they accept for student success and how much they accept for student failure. I'll talk more about that in a second. And then finally, great teachers measure their success as teachers in terms of the success of their students. All right, let's take them one at a time. Most of you know Laird Small. Laird's not only one of the greatest teachers I know, he's also a wonderful human being. All right. And I asked Laird if I could share this story with you, and he said it'd be okay. A few years ago, a young woman showed up on his doorstep with a, with a, uh, a young boy in her hand, and she said, my husband, this boy's father, was recently killed in a tragic accident. This boy's been pretty despondent ever since. Doesn't want to go out and play, doesn't want to socialize with anybody, is pretty withdrawn. I'm thinking if he had a new activity, he might reconnect with life. Can you do anything for him? Well, Laird took him under his wing and encouraged the mother to bring one of the boy's friends, which he did. It took a while, but the boy began getting back into life. He began to realize that there were some pleasures left, that some people did care. And this was Laird. What we find with novices is that they tend to teach a standard set of progressive skills. And I know all of you have watched beginners. Every one of us was a beginner. All right? So if you're going to teach golf as a beginner, what do you do? Probably teach the grip, then the setup, all right? then maybe the takeaway, downswing, follow through. You teach one size fits all. You teach every student as if they were the same student. Experts don't do that. Experts teach students the skills that they think those students need to be most successful based on what the students perceive as to be success. If a student wants to be a competitor, like you saw Robin uh, Damron out here, Robert wants to perform at the highest level. Well, that's certainly different than somebody who's getting into sport for the first time all right, and simply wants to get the ball airborne. All right? So great teachers find ways to connect to the students. One of the best stories I ever heard that illustrates this point was uh, Dr. Rod Thorpe in England. Rod was at one time one of the national uh, tennis coaches for the, uh, for the country. And he had a woman, 55 years old, that came to him for a tennis lesson. Her husband was going to be retired, and she was looking for something that they could do together. Fine, said Rod, I can teach you tennis. All right, so he gets her out there, and, and Rod says, OK, the first thing you need to learn is to serve, because the serve begins the game. And if you don't begin the game, you can't play the game. That makes sense. And so the woman started to serve, and Rod was trying, Rod was trying to help her. You know, First of all, you're not tossing the ball high enough. You need to get a little further. All right, it's out too far in front of you. Your racket's not back far enough. You're not getting your weight forward. After 20 minutes, the woman put the ball down, put the racket on top of it, walked up to Rod, gave him, gave him her hand, and said, thank you. Rod said, the lesson's not over yet. She says, yes, it is. She says, I want to thank you for teaching me in a short time that I will never be able to play tennis. That's a true story. And Rod said, I was devastated. I'm a tennis teacher, and I'm teaching people they can't play. All right. That began to change the way Rod approached his whole approach to the game. And he began to teach people, not the sport. All right. Uh, some of you may recognize Tubby Smith. Tubby is the men's basketball, at the, uh, basketball coach at the University of Kentucky. When he was at the University of Georgia, he and I became close friends. I'll tell you this about Tubby. 
If you have kids, you want them to grow up to be like somebody, I would love my kids to grow up to be like Tubby Smith. When Tubby and I were talking one time, I asked him about how much responsibility does a coach have for winning and losing? And he laughed and he says, well, the coach has no responsibility for winning. The players win the game. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, from where I sit, I can't score a single point. He says, but coaches can certainly lose games. And he says, I've seen a lot of coaches lose a lot of games and blame it on the players. Okay. In research that we've done in a couple of sports and also public schools, we've done three studies of this, and we always get the same finding. The novice teachers are willing to accept credit for students' successes. But when students fail, they generally blame the student. The student wasn't motivated. The student didn't practice. The student didn't have enough talent. All right. You name it. All right. I had that student's brother last year, and they were just as bad as this guy. All right. Great coaches, great teachers don't talk like that. Experts look to themselves first in identifying the cause for student failure. All right? They believe that if they think hard enough and work hard enough, they can find a way to teach this. Uh, how many of you participated in the 10-minute lessons that were given here on Wednesday? Yes, yeah, some of you did. That was great. I really enjoyed that. I had the opportunity to go out, or I should say the honor to go out with Craig Shanklin and Laird and uh, Carol Mann for dinner after that and Rick Martino. And as we were getting ready to leave, I was saying goodnight to Craig, and, and he said to me, and I, we were talking about the 10-minute lessons, and he says, you know, I think I'm going to lose sleep tonight. And I said, for what? He says, because I could have taught one of those lessons better. He started telling me about a lady that he had. All right. This is Craig Shanklin. Craig Shanklin, who is on America's Top 100 Golf Instructor list. Craig Shanklin, who is the PGA Teacher of the Year. Craig Shanklin teaches at one of the meccas of golf here in the state of Florida is going to lose sleep because a woman who came to him for a 10-minute lesson who he never saw before, will never see again, and didn't pay him a dime for the lesson is going to lose sleep. Craig Shanklin is a better teacher today than he was that day because of that. Great teachers think like that. They feel responsible for student success and for student failure. When you believe that the student can't learn, you don't teach. Okay, S student success and teaching success go hand in hand. Successful teachers measure themselves in terms of successful students. All right, I really couldn't find an appropriate picture for this, but I thought this was kind of cute. This was at a, uh, a training camp that we have for the Swedish uh, golfers. The, uh, <clears throat> the coach is Dr. Bob Christina, former dean at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And the golfer is Katrin Nilsmark. If you look really closely, you'll realize Katrin's hitting golf balls about a month before uh, her second child was born. All right? The person observing her is Per Ulrich Johansson. All right. Great teachers believe that anyone can learn if the teaching is good enough. Think about that perspective. Anyone can learn if I'm a good enough teacher. And you wonder how they got to be great all right? by thinking just like that. They also expect mastery. They believe that the students are going to master what they're teaching. And if the students don't, again, they feel responsible. They work until the student has mastered those skills. And I've seen some of these great teachers do things that you just wouldn't believe possible with students. And they enjoyed every minute of it. All right, let me turn now to teaching practices. <clears throat> and, I, and I picked these uh, six to share with you. Uh, first of all, learning about the student. How do these great teachers do that? Secondly, they only set one or two goals, and I'm going to go over these point by point. I'm going to talk about how they analyze strengths and weaknesses, All right. and I'm going to tell you how that they identify the single most important factor to teach their students or players. They also have highly developed routines and rituals, and finally, great lessons have great endings. In fact, let me tell you right now, the, the most important minutes in any lesson are usually the last two or three. All right? Think about great music or great books. It's the ending that you remember. All right? And so lessons are the same way. How you close a lesson is critically important. The second most important couple of minutes are the first couple because that sets the tone for the whole lesson. All right? So if you're going to give attention to any part of your teaching, first look at the, the how you close it. And I'll talk about that as I close this session. All right, this is Lynn Marriott working with one of her students. All right, Lynn's fantastic. 
because she asks students questions. Did you notice when David Ledbetter, uh, Robert Dameron walked up to Ledbetter, the first thing he started to do was ask questions? Yeah, he had to know about this student. All right, and so automatically he began asking questions. It's just part of a routine that he does, and all great teachers have it. All right. Next, it's important that the students talk. Here's a tip. If your students don't talk within the first 10 minutes of a lesson, they probably won't for the rest of the lesson. Get them talking early. Particularly, even if it's just to say, I'm doing fine today, yeah, the weather is, could be a lot better, and uh, you know, my cat was sick and I took it to the vets. Doesn't matter. Get their lips moving and get words coming out. All right? This is critically important. All right? Because if you don't know what's going on between the ears of your students, you don't know what's going on in the lesson. Just because you can see them swing or not swing a golf ball doesn't mean that, or swing a golf club, doesn't mean that they're getting what you're saying. And it also means you don't really understand what's motivating them. Right? You don't understand their personality factors. You've got to learn about your students. It's probably the thing that will make you a better coach or a better teacher. Right? And finally, once your students start talking, listen. And listen carefully. Right? And they know if you're listening or not. Don't ask the rhetorical rhetorical questions. How you doing today? Good? Oh, great. Okay, well, let's get started. All right? That's not a question. All right? Listen to them. And then when they have a problem, they'll talk to you. All right? They'll approach you. We did a study of American coaches and European coaches. And one of the biggest difference we notice is a thing called approach tendencies. In other words, and this was done, uh, sponsored by the International Olympic Committee. So these were Olympic level athletes. And what we found was with the European, uh, and it was more than just one country, with the European athletes, they'd walk up to a coach and they'd tell the coach, him or her, that they had an injury or they didn't understand something or they wanted a coach's insight. With the American athletes, they never did it. The athletes seldom, if ever, approached coaches. The coaches went to the athletes. Right? And when we began to analyze it, we began to realize the reason was, first of all, American coaches seldom ask questions. And when they did, they didn't listen to students all right, or athletes. There would be questions like, what's the matter with you? You lazy? That's probably not going to get much of a response. All right? But the European coaches were quite different. All right? So if you want students to come to you when they have problems and concerns, you have to give them the message that you're a listener. Here's uh, Peter Matson, <clears throat> the head coach of the, the Swedish golf team. Um, and I believe he's working with Matthias Gronberg at the British Open in 2003. All right. And this is kind of a, a strategy that we've developed. And we also noticed it with really great coaches. You analyze the strengths and weaknesses of your players. And most of you are very good at that. You could sit down in a video and you could pick out an endless number of flaws. I mean, some of my friends in the audience who are golf instructors have been watching me this week and they're just having a field day. I feel like a used car at a mechanics convention. Everybody's trying to fix me. <laughs> All right. But what we found with, with great uh, players is first of all, tell them what they do well. All right. And this applies to novices too. People will repeat things they do well if you reinforce them for it. They won't necessarily correct it if you tell them what they do wrong. All right? But again, they tend to do well what you tell them. A study that was done by John Wooden, probably considered the greatest basketball coach of all time, at least in the collegiate ranks, all right? found that he praised his athletes. In other words, he told them what they do well to the number of times he criticized them at a ratio that was four to one. Four praises for every time he gave a criticism. All right? That's unusual. But so is his record of success. All right. But what happens if you find a student or an athlete is having uh, a problem? All right. Think about this as a perspective. Tell them what they need to do to, to perform better. They don't necessarily need to know what they're doing wrong. As a teacher, you do. But what they need to know is what to do to get better. Let me use an analogy here if I can. Let's say I'm a softball coach and you're trying to learn to be a better softball batter. All right. If I said to you, all right, I'm watching you swing. Look, your weight's too far back. All right. You got the barrel head of the bat way ahead of your hands. All right. Your shoulders are way open. You're going to pull the ball every time. What's this beginning to get you to think about your own performance? All right. Now, what if I said this? 
you know, there's some things in your swing that look pretty good. You've got your eye on the ball the whole time. If you're not watching the ball, you're not going to hit it. I like that. I said, I'll tell you what, this will make you a more effective hitter. In fact, this is what Derek Jeter does. As you step through the ball, have your hands lead, all right? And don't let the barrel of the bat reach, reach the ball until it's level with your hands. Lead with the hands, all right? I haven't told you anything wrong. What I've told you is what you're going to do to be better. And this is far more successful than cataloging the errors that everybody makes, okay? Great coaches do this for the most part. Okay, this is Pia Nilsson. Most of you know the name Pia Nilsson. Pia uh, was a Swedish coach for a long time, Annika Sorenstam and many of the other great Swedish players. All right? One of the things I notice in watching Pia and other coaches is they tend to identify, and this is hard, they identify the single most important factor that will make the biggest difference in an athlete's or a student's performance. If you can do that, you are way ahead of the game and that's tough. Novices, by the way, are great at identifying all the errors that somebody is making. But if you ask them what one would make the biggest difference in the performance, they generally can't tell you. Experts can also tell you what are causes for problems and what are symptoms. In other words, if I, cause, if I correct this, then all these other things will take care of themselves. All right. So let me tell you Pia's secret. All right. And Annika Sorenstam still does this to this day. Player walks off a golf course, and the first question Pia asks him is this, what did you do good? All right, in your performance today, in your round, what did you good? Let's celebrate your successes. How was your putting? Was it good? All right. Were you hitting fairways? Was that good? All right, let's identify what we do well. All right, what are our strengths? All right, next question. What could we do better? Again, not what, what did we do wrong, all right, but what could be better? All right. And she has the players identify this. So the players take ownership over what they're going to improve. And the final question she asks them is this, how can we make it better? In other words, what do we need to do? All right. You see a lot of Swedes practicing after a round, it's because of these three questions. All right. They go out and practice. And sometimes what they decide is, uh, I, I could be better rested. And they do, all right? Some of these players have unbelievable travel schedules. Okay, how are we going to get more rest? I think I'm going to leave the golf course early today. Great idea. Let's do that, okay? Here's Mike Perpich, one of America's top 100 golf instructors, all right? One of the characteristic keys to Mike's good teaching is that he only works on one or two goals per lesson. He doesn't try to cure all the ills of anybody in 30 minutes. All right, let's work on one thing at a time, and he's able to prioritize them. Sometimes you can work on two or three things at a time. All right? But normally, you want to focus on one goal. All right? Here's Nicholas Foss working with his swing coach, Graham Crisp. <coughs> Nicholas is, is a wonderful athlete to work at because he's very uh, object-oriented. You give him an objective, and that's what he works on. Stays very focused. Think about this, if the goal is to master a good grip, and that's really what you're trying to work on, the player knows that, you know that, that's what you're working on, okay. Explain it to them, teach them, demonstrate it, whatever it takes, all right? So they get the information on what it takes to have a good grip, all right? Then, select activities where they can practice the grip, more than just one, all right? Give them two or three, they're gonna learn better that way, all right? And then give feedback only on the grip, Drives me nuts when I see beginners, and I can generally identify them because they'll spend 20 minutes talking about something about a swing plane or transfer weight, whatever it is, I don't care. The player does it, and then they start giving feedback on something completely different. You know what they just did with the first 20 minutes of the lesson? <laughs> Flushed it right away. If you're working on something like the grip, like the stance, and the player's performing it, give them feedback on that. And it's only when the player masters it Move on to another objective and let the player know. All right. If your teaching feels very ineffective, if your players aren't developing, check your teaching. See if you're doing this. See if you're picking one thing and getting them to master it. All right, let's talk about great communicators. I'm going to give you some comparisons here between novices and some experts. All right, first, novices tend to use a single method to make many points. For example, let's sit down and watch your, a videotape of your swing, all right? So here we are, I videotape your swing, we sit down, I'm a novice teacher, and now I start telling you from the time you inhale, 
all right? Every mistake you make, all right? And so then I go out and I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to tell you every mistake you make, all right? I'm using a single method, just my explanation. And I'm telling you about 50, 60 different points, all right? Expert teachers don't do that. They use multiple methods to make the same point. All right, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second because that's important. All right, novices, teachers talk, students listen. Consistently, we find this in all levels of sport instruction. Novice teachers talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. Their students never talk, all right? Not in the class or a practice of an expert. Teachers talk or coaches talk, and then athletes talk, and teachers listen, coaches listen. All right. It was funny, I, before I leave that point, Jack Bowerly, who is um, the swim coach at Georgia, and he's co currently the uh, national swim coach from the United States. He was one of our Olympic swim coaches in, in Greece. Uh, he and I were having lunch uh, a couple of weeks before he left for Greece this year. And uh, we were talking. He, always interested in the kind of stuff I'm doing. And we were talking at lunch, and he says, okay, I'm going to see all these coaches over there. How am I going to know the great ones? And I said, Jack, within 10 minutes, listen to them. The ones that are listening to athletes in particular and other coaches are probably the ones that are going to be better. All right? The second link thing to look for is look for the people who ask the questions rather than give the information. Right? When great teachers or coaches talk, what they say is critically important. All right. When novices talk, they tell you anything that's going on in their head, random thoughts and rambling teaching. All right. So experts use purposeful, focused communication. All right. Most of you read Harvey Penick's book, okay, Little Red Book. How about the lesson where he gave where he left the person on the practice range? He couldn't figure out what to tell him, so he went home, uh, sat in his lazy boy, called the guy the next morning because he figured out what he needed to say to the guy. Didn't say anything until he figured out what needed to be said. Okay, if you, go to Durham, oh, yeah. if you go to Durham, North Carolina, Duke University, you're going to find two great coaches and one great golf instructor. All right? Most of us know Mike Krzyzewski, great basketball coach. Most of you have probably also heard of Dan Brooks, all right? great women's golf coach up there. All right? You'll also hopefully meet Ed Abargian. All right? This is Ed's teaching station. A right? little complex for teaching a golf swing. All right? But Ed's one of those instructors that knows many ways to make a single point. All right? Ed likes to use what he calls the string. I've seen some marvelous lessons taught with a string, a golf lesson. All right? All right, let's just get, uh, let me give you some insights on different ways you can make a single point. The easiest one is an explanation. Just tell somebody how to do it. Okay? You could use a metaphor, and we find metaphors are very, very powerful. All right. I'm going to tell you about that in just a second because we did a follow-up study on metaphor. Right. You can use a demonstration or a modeling of some kind. You can use a training aid. You can use video. You can have the students read something, either during the practice or when they go home. You can have them peer teach. And by the way, this is a powerful teaching technique. If you've got two or more students, have them analyze each other. And they can give each other feedback. If you've made it clear what to look for, powerful, powerful teaching aid. And finally, you can do self-teaching. Ask more questions. Get them to figure out what they need to do. Jane Frost, who again is also on America's Top 100 Golf Instructor list, is really skilled at this. She gets students, and she used to work uh, with Nancy Lopez for a while. She gets the students to tell her what they need to work on and then how they're going to do it. She's very good at that. All right? So let's just take a look. Explanations, metaphors, demonstrations, training aids, videos, read, peer teaching, self-teaching. Many ways to make a single point. All right, I told you I was going to tell you a little bit about metaphors. We did a study of metaphors about two years ago, and we looked at 15 of America's top 100 golf instructors. These are some of the best of the best, all right? And we went and we analyzed, watched them teach and videotaped their teaching. We didn't tell them, for some strange reason, they trust us. They haven't figured it out yet. But they let us come and videotape them. And what we were interested in was what kinds of metaphors that they use and do the students remember them? When we actually got out to their teaching stations, we found that they tended to use more video and fewer metaphors. They used some, but not all that many. Almost all of them used video. Well, the way we designed the study, two weeks later, we gave the students a phone call. We asked them to recall the information from the lesson. 
the students recalled very few points from the video analysis. Those that received the video to take home, none of them looked at it. But they remembered every single metaphor. Amazing. I was just talking to Gail Peterson, who teaches down at Sea Island, as, a, as a, I consider a good friend and also a great teacher. All right? She taught a lesson for a study we were doing seven years ago. I still remember the metaphor she used. She was working with a beginning college student. She asked a college student, do you like pizza? I mean, of course college kids like pizza. You ever see a pizza delivered? She said, yeah, that's the takeaway in golf. All right, that's the backswing. All right, seven years later, I still remember it. My grad students grabbed a hold of that, went out onto the driving range, and they said, hey, that works. All right? Metaphors can be very powerful teaching tools. All right? And what we found concluding this study was several students reported the metaphors were highly effective in practicing. And they also found it made a difference in their performance. Metaphors like, you know, don't squeeze the, uh, the grip any tighter than a tube of toothpaste. I mean, you've heard them all, all right? Students found them really effective. They found this, the video less effective. Does that mean video shouldn't be used? No. I just don't believe we figured out how to best use it yet. OK, Freddie Jakobson. Some of you know Freddie Yock, all right? I was having breakfast one morning uh, with Freddie and his wife, Erica, and uh, we were talking about his teacher, Ricard. And he says, yep, there's three things. <laughs> if any of you have seen Freddie swing, you'll know this is funny just from the start. He says, there's three things wrong with my swing. All right? He said, and that'll keep Ricard in business the rest of his life. All right? But Freddie's got it down to three things. All right? Most players can't remember more than three things. So keep your points few, but keep them potent. Right? Make them count for something. Realize you have limited time to say something to these students. Make it count. Also make it positive. All right? In some way, you've got to celebrate the success of your students. What Freddie's holding up there is a bag of dumlis, which is Swedish candy. All right? When we run our, our training camps for the Swedish professionals and also for the amateurs, we started this off because most of the amateurs we were working with on the national team were college students here in the U.S. All right, on scholarship. And what we thought would be nice for them is to bring over some Swedish candy. And so most of our um, practice activities are set in a competitive environment. We know that the closer a practice is to actual performance, the easier the transfer. So everything we do is in a competitive nature. All right? But rather than just have the competition, we give them reward. And so we gave the, the amateurs uh, Swedish candy. So when Peter and I, Mats and I were planning this camp that we had last year, I said, bring some candy over, which he did. And then we also went out and bought CDs and bottles of wine and other things that we thought the players would like. Well, they didn't like the CDs, and they didn't like the wine. Jesper Parnovic has a wine cellar that rivals most restaurants. All right? They love the candy. All right? And this was in January. You know, in July, they were still talking about the candy. All right? You can see Freddie was really proud of what he won that day. OK, expert teachers have highly developed routines and rituals. All right, the picture on the left is uh, Mike Bender and Zach Johnson. I took this picture in Dallas with the Byron Nelson all right, this year. All right. I love to watch Mike and Zach work. It's a conversation. All right. Mike asks Zach a question. Zach gives him an answer. Zach asks Mike a question. Mike a responds, asks another question. It's purely a conversation. It sounds like two friends talking about something. And you can see the picture on the left. That's exactly what they're doing. In this particular case, they were talking about wedge play. All right. The picture on the right is also Zach and Mike working, but here at, at uh, Mike's facility in Florida. Notice how close they are together. The proximity is telling. It's a routine. Notice they're both focused on the same thing. Again, it's a conversation. They're discussing it. Mike's not lecturing Zach. All right? Zach's asking questions. It's a routine that describes Mike Bender's instructional process. You talk to most of his students, and that's what you're going to see. Questions, responses, questions, responses. It's a two-way street. It's a highly developed routine and ritual. OK, what are routines and rituals? First of all, they're purposeful and they're repeated actions in their activities. They're your instructional signatures at what makes you unique. All right? They're what works for you. All right? And why they're important is because students will come to look for them. 
If you open your lesson or close your lesson differently every time or change things radically, students don't really know what to expect. They don't know when to talk, for example. They don't know when to perform. So routines are very important. Think about your routine in opening a lesson. We saw Ledbetter. I'm going to guess that every lesson he opens starts with a handshake and a question about how are you and what you've been doing. Just a guess. All right. Great teachers, it's just a routine. He can't help it. He probably brushes his teeth, just like all of us, with the same hand every day and starts with the same tooth. There's certain routines that we have. Your teaching is described that way. Take a look at your routines, particularly lesson openings. Verbal instructions. I was just telling you about Mike and Zach, how they work. Nonverbal instructions, all right? Things like training aids, for example. Do you have routines there that you can use? All right. Positioning. This is, again, Peter Matson with, working with one of our players, Ricard Johnson. I think this was at the uh, Scandinavian Masters this year. All right. Where you're located, students know where to look. All right. If you're all over the place, they never know where to find you. Lesson orchestration. Do you start in a certain way and build momentum to end in a certain way? Most lessons that are fairly effective start at a pace that's fairly easy, build until they're about three quarters of the way through the lesson, and then it eases off and tapers. All right? Think about how you orchestrate the lesson. When are you going to make the most important point? Where are you working? Great teachers, great coaches are great at orchestrating certain things. And finally, lesson closures. I'm going to talk in detail about that in just a second, All right? like right now. All right. I just said lesson closing is one of the most, or probably the most important part of your lesson. All right? What should you do in a lesson closure? Well, I can tell you what great coaches and great teachers do. First and foremost, they summarize the key points. What was learned today? What were the three things I taught you about a softball swing? Right. Most of them do it in this way. They check for understanding. They ask the student to tell them, what did you learn today? What are the three most important things in a softball swing? All right. Or in a takeaway, or in a grip, or whatever. Show this to me. All right. They check for understanding. They make sure the student doesn't leave the lesson tee or the athlete leave the practice without knowing what the practice was all about. They highlight the success. Success breeds success, whether you're talking about a beginner golfer or an elite golfer. All right? They were successful in the lesson. If they weren't, you weren't successful teaching it. They had to do something right. Let them end with a positive swing, you know, where they felt like the ball was, they got some good ball flight there. Okay? And finally, end with practice activities in a schedule. Again, this is Mike Perpich. Mike is great at giving his, his students um, activities that they can do, and he checks their progress as they go along. If your student is a, a busy executive and he or she works in an office, well, maybe you can give them some putting tips that they can do each day, all right? Or talk about what they could do at home, or if they got some spare time, what they can do um, in terms of the schedule. All right? Most of you, I think, are sharp enough to know that if a student doesn't have time to practice, the student's not going to get better. All right. Let me leave you with a couple of things. How can you develop your own expertise? First and foremost is you can increase your knowledge. Great teachers and great coaches know just about, well, let me put it this way. Most of them admitted to us is they don't know everything, but they probably know more, more about their sport and their players than most people do. All right. So how can you increase your, your knowledge? First and foremost, go watch other teachers. Most of you are doing it here today. Most of us learned a lot by watching David Ledbetter or Stan Utley this morning. Tomorrow you're going to see some great teachers. Hank's going to teach. Laird's going to teach. I think Craig's going to teach. I don't know who else Rick's got lined up. Some wonderful, wonderful teachers. Okay. But do it in your own hometown, too. There's other teachers that are there. Go watch them, good or bad. All right? It gives you ideas. Listen to your students. They'll tell you more about your teaching than anyone. If it's not working on them, it's not working. And if it is successful, they'll tell you that too. Attend seminars. You're already doing that. Keep doing it. You'll learn something. Read. This is an interesting fact. I had a hard time believing it until after three studies, it always proved true. One of the key points that separates very good performers, whether you're talking about chess players, and the study was done in chess, or you're talking about great coaches, is their library. Library the number of books they read. When we walked into Bobby Bowden's office, all right, it was surrounded not by trophies, but by books. 
On his desk were piled books. In fact, the first one I spotted was a new book that John Wooden had just written, autographed, and sent to Bowden. All right? We asked Bowden what kind of books he likes. All kinds. Particularly, he likes to read military strategies. He likes to read biographies of great generals because that's what he thinks he, he is. All right? He's a strategist. That's what his job as a head coach is. I talked to Pia Nilsson. She reads all about student learning. All right? Stuff that's way outside of golf. All right? Read. Practice your teaching skills. Teaching is a lot like golf. If you don't practice what you do, you can't get better. So think of your teaching as a set of skills that you can improve. First and foremost, practice your interviewing skills, asking questions. We know very few teachers do ask questions. Right. Again, spotted Ledbetter doing it. I'm going to guess tomorrow you're going to see the same thing. These people just do it as a matter of routine. Okay. Develop your analytic school skills. Find different ways of analyzing students. Sure, video works. Your observation works. Have students analyze the thing, uh, their own performance. See if you get the same thing. Right. Establish goals. If you're not doing it now, you need to have that. And you need to share that with their student. If I come to you for a lesson, all right, I hope you tell me what it is you and I are going to work on, what we're going to improve. And it would be a real bonus if you would tell me how I would know I improve this. Okay. And practice your lesson closings. This is the most important part of your lesson. All right, check yourself. Do you close the lesson by summarizing the key points? Have the students do it. Do the students leave telling you what they've learned? All right. If they can't, perhaps you need to refund their money because they didn't learn anything. All right. And I know some teachers who do that, by the way. All right. Listen and learn. All right. If you're a talk -a box you're going to learn less than if you're a good listener. All right. Let me emphasize that again. Listen and learn. All right. Let me close with uh, one of my favorite poems that I've adopted from uh, Longfellow. You want to know how to be great? Longfellow puts it eloquently when he says, the heights, and I put teachers in there, the heights by great teachers reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. It takes effort. It takes practice. It takes passion. And yes, it takes a little bit of talent to be a great teacher or a great coach. And I'll tell you, there's a great many problems in this world, and teachers can't solve them all, but I'll tell you this. Great teachers do make a difference. Thank you for listening.